Welcome back, dear friends, to another class of Exploring the Advent of Divine Justice. Tonight, we'll be continuing part 21. And without further, any further ado, we'll have our opening prayer. Thank you so much. O oh, thou unseen friend, O oh, desire of all in this world and the world to come, O oh, thou compassionate beloved, these helpless souls are captivated by thy love, and these feeble ones seek shelter at thy threshold. Every night they sigh and moan in their remoteness from me, and every morn they lament and weep by reason of the onslaught of the peoples of malice. They are afflicted at every moment with a fresh anguish and are sore tried at each breath by the tyranny of the wicked oppressor. Praise be to thee that notwithstanding this, they are ablaze as the temple of fire and shine resplendent as the sun and moon. They stand tall like upraised banners in the cause of God and hasten like base valiant horsemen unto the arena. They have bloomed like sweet blossoms and are filled with joy like the laughing rose. Wherefore, O thou loving provider, Graciously assist these holy souls by thy heavenly grace, which is vouchsafed from thy kingdom, and grant that these sanctified beings may manifest the signs of the Most High. Thou art the all bountiful, the pitiful, the all merciful, the compassionate. Excellent. Thank you very much, Miss Darla. Okay, dear friends, so in our last session, we read um, the paragraphs from 95 through 102, and we also covered the major key points of these paragraphs. And I'm going to share my screen so we'll get back into it. So as you recall, um, we've been covering on all the aspects of pioneering. What do we need to do as a teacher of the cause of God? And so let me share my screen. So we're back here. Okay, here we are, dear friends. Okay. Oh, and my... So... Everyone ready? Here we go. So in paragraphs 95 through 99, the beloved guardian provides further counsels for the teachers and the pioneers who rose during the seven year plan to open the virgin territories to the faith. And in paragraph 95, the beloved guardian, Sholif and he recommends that the travel teachers and the pioneers should mix in a friendly manner with all the local people and acquaint themselves with every aspect of their culture while concentrating on those souls who have shown receptivity. The beloved guardian then cites a statement from Baha'u'llah on how the teachings of the faith should be shared with others. And these are the two extracts you can see on the right. So how they should uh, meet with others, we should consort, with the followers of all religions in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship. And then the, the, the extract from Baha'u'llah, a kindly tongue is the lodestone of the hearts of men. It is the bread of the spirit. It clothed the, with the words, with meaning. It is the fountain of the light of wisdom and understanding. So this is how we should address anyone that we come across with a kindly tongue. And what is a lodestone? Anyone know what a lodestone is? We've heard this word <laughs> uh, uttered before. Anyone? It's a magnet. That's right, Miss Claudia, it's a magnet. That's right, it has it's a magnet, has magnetic qualities. So a kindly tongue is having a magnet, and that magnetic quality of attraction using that magnetic forces of attraction instead of the hearts of men. So that kindly tongue brings them to us. So having that kindly tongue, it has that aspect of attraction. 
It is the bread of the spirit. It cloveth the words of meaning. It is the fountain of the light of wisdom and understanding. So having that kindly tongue, it brings them to you. Right? It you makes <clears throat> Dear Test Fire, please. Yeah, what, what I understand from this quotation is, you know, the heart and the tongue, you know, the relationship in between them is, you know, it's expressed the human character and behaviors together. So it is very, very important. That's, That's right. That's what it is. That's right, dear Tesfa. And this yeah. is all to do again with rectitude of conduct, right? Because rectitude of conduct was uh, our first weapon that we, we addressed. And so, um, and so having this kindly tongue is all in part of having that correct attitude, rectitude, correct attitude, having that level of your attitude being correct. So when your tongue, which is the vehicle of expression and utterance, is in a sense having kindliness attached to it and clothed on it and adorning it. Imagine your tongue being naked in a sense. But what should be clothing it is the ornaments and the beauty of kindliness, honesty, and truthfulness. So this should be the cloth of it, so that when it's you utter, and have, imagine that all the wonderful learnings and sayings and memorizations emitted by your tongue, so that your tongue is clothed with the jewels of praise of Baha'u'llah, so that your tongue becomes a vehicle of his name, so that this is when your tongue becomes clothed in beauty. Follow? So this is um, the highest station of your tongue, the purpose of the expression of your tongue. So everything has a purpose. Your tongue has a purpose. What is the purpose of your tongue? It is to magnify his name. That is your purpose of your tongue. The purpose of your ears is to hear his name. To hear his name. The purpose of your eyes is to see his name. And what does that mean to see his name? It is to see the creative word. And so that it soaks into your heart and penetrates into your soul. So every aspect of our creation, our, our creation, our entity has a purpose. But the, the greatest of all the organs in the sense of course, is our mind and our brain, what we think reality, physical being, but in reality is the tongue, because in the sense, the tongue becomes the purpose and vehicle for the expression. So then you can bring forth all the wonderful aspects of our mind and our heart coming out to, to promulgate his name. You follow? So this that's, in the sense- That's why we need to beautify our tongues. Excellent, my dear Tesfaye, exactly, that's right. And so the, how do we beautify the tongue? It's through our training of our entire being, our character, our attitude, so that every, and then do you remember there was one of the five aspects of purity was, it was to, um, was to um, clean mindedness, clean mindedness right so that when you any thought that enters here should if it's not pure you have to keep it clean so that because what happens very often a, 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 a thought of war comes then we should oppose it by a stronger thought of peace a thought of hatred it should have thought oppose it with a strong, stronger thought of love so because what happens if we have a thought of hatred it's so quick to go from here to here, and then you say something wrong, right? So it goes from here to here, and then we say something bad. So we should have clean mindedness so that anything is up here, we should have immediate love. So when that love and kindness comes out, it pours out of our mouths. This is the aspect of rectitude of conduct and chaste and holy life. 
preparing ourselves so then our mouths will emit the most beautiful thing. Okay. You know, in a short, uh, in a short, it's better to say that it is <clears throat> human being is exactly what you are practicing every single day. Baha'is, we practice prayers and meditations and everything. So our rectitude and the, who we are, it's to be determined by the way how we are acting. So our practice is the most important thing. That's absolutely right. That's very true. Excellent. Moving on, my dear friends. Let's get through some slides today. Okay. So continuing in paragraphs 95 through 99, in paragraph 96, the beloved guardian, Shogh Effendi, he counsels every single individual believer, whether a member of a Baha'i institution or a prospective teacher of the faith, which are every one of you should all be prospective teacher of the faith, to seize any opportunity to get to know people who are citizens of pioneering countries or have some connection to them. This is so important because Abdul Baha said this is during the whole formative period. They should plant the seeds of belief in their hearts through kindness and sharing the literature of the faith without placing any pressure on them or attempting to proselytize. So this is the time of sowing of the seed. So we, we plant the seeds, but we're not forcing the seeds to grow. <laughs> when I was uh, very young, and you've, uh, many of you have met um, on Zoom my parents, my mom and my dad. And when I was in seventh grade, um, as a young, young, um, young chap, my, um, in school there was um, a science fair. And in the science fair, um, it said, learn the growth of a plant. So I had to learn how plants grow. So I, did, um, so I had to plant many different seeds. And I was so impatient. I was just not patient with these seeds. So, and you had to track every day, day one, day two, day three, what is the growth of the germination of the seed, the seedling growing, the little roots and all that business. I was not a patient. So I, I planted the seeds day one, right? And day three, I would poke the soil. Is this thing growing? You know, I would, and then I would take the seed out and, you know, look at it. And then I would like, mommy, it's not growing. This thing is not doing a good job. And so then I would put, kind of thrust it back into the soil and hoping that thing grew. Not a very successful science fair, but, you know, in long story short, this is not our job of proselytization because I was literally proselytizing my seeds. I was forcing them to grow. I pushed them down further and further and saying, grow seed, you're not doing a good job. Our job is only to plant the seeds. That's it. And then step back and let it grow. Okay? And have faith in the seeds and in what we have conveyed to them. We should shower upon them love and love and feed them and nutrition in the sense of feeding them is give them love and guidance, nurture the souls just as they are seeds. So that is what we're called upon. Okay. Now, moving on to paragraph 97, 97. In paragraph 97, the beloved guardian, Shoghi Effendi, calls on all the American believers with American professions. This is so important because when you go pioneering, and, and especially back in the day, they would call upon the usage of the funds. So it was draining the funds, the international pioneering funds. So the beloved guardian, he says, if you're going pioneering, especially to all those friends coming from with American professions, that we're planning to permanently live. So he says, go, if you're planning to go pioneering, he says, per, plan to permanently live and work in those pioneering posts where you can earn your means of livelihood. So you're not just going to go there and then call upon the funds and say, hey, I'm here, I'm pioneering, please send me some money. <laughs> so the beloved guardian say, no, that's, you know, go with a profession. 
and establish yourself, have a profession there. And so then you can establish um, means of livelihood for yourself. And then that will help reduce the increasing pressures on the teaching fund. So this was called from the Blava Guardian, paragraph 97. And if it proves impossible to take advantage of such a privilege and go and do uh, the pioneering, the beloved guardian goes further. What does he say? He says you should appoint someone as a deputy. That's so awesome. So if you can't go pioneering and go teaching yourself, he says appoint someone in your stead. Deputize someone. He says deputize a pioneer, uh, a deputy pioneer, and someone that will teach on your behalf. And the beloved guardian then cites a statement from His Holiness Baha'u'llah on teaching deputization in paragraph 97. So that's paragraph 97. And now we're going to get into some of the coolest paragraphs coming up. And uh, so you're going to start now seeing paragraph 100, which is really on women, women. But before that, he gave, uh, the beloved guardian mentions two individuals in paragraph 99. One of them went to Bulgaria and one of them went to Australasia. So we're going to get into that first. So the councils, these are some quotes from some, uh, this is from St. Ignatius Loyola. He says, go forth and set the world on fire. Isn't that a cool quote? I could, the beloved guardians, you know, always says that. Go forth and set the world on fire. This is what we should do as a Baha'i. And this is from Carrie Fisher. I, I know her as Princess Leia. So, you know, I, if you're a Star Wars fan, that's how I know her. So she says, stay afraid, but do it anyway. What's important is the action. You don't have to wait to be confident. Just do it. And eventually the confidence will follow, right? So stay afraid, but do it anyway. It's okay to be afraid. But go forth, go with the action. You don't have to wait, but be confident. And that's the aspect of reliance on who? Reliance on him. Reliance on him. Have faith in him. Fall into his arms. If he says, go forth, go forth. And that's it. Now, we're getting into paragraph 98. Then we're going to get into some of these um, sections that I've put together on these handmaidens of the cause of God. So in paragraph 98, the beloved guardian states that pioneers and travel teachers should be in constant communication with the National Committee of North America to receive stimulus and necessary guidance. So imagine that I'm going to go international pioneering to this little town in Brazil, but I'm there, but I'm not keeping in communication. <laughs> so I'm all alone, I'm, I'm, but I'm here, I'm in Brazil. No, the beloved guardian says, stay in constant communication for multiple reasons. One, that pioneer receives guidance, energies, love, in, uh, and spurs them. Um, because when you're all alone in a pioneering post, sometimes you lose heart. You lose the fire, you lose the energy because you're all alone. But so with having that connection of guidance, you, um, that energy infuses you. Also, another reason is sometimes these pioneering posts, things may happen internationally or even nationally or around you that you may not even be aware of. So that guidance may come and say, hey, it might not be safe for you. You might have to leave your pioneering post and go somewhere that is, you know, outside, uh, you know, out of safety. So that level of guidance comes to you and assists you. So that having that level of communication is ever important. And so these, um, this constant communication with the National Committee of North America, and also ha having that level of, per se, um, oversight and sight that you, because they are so close in the action, but seeing it at a high, a different level helps them um, 
for the level of teaching work that is necessary. And they should also cooperate with the fellow believers in pioneering countries to facilitate the progress of the faith. And this will set an example for the future generations who will continue the work. And so I put this um, hello from the other side. Um, this is uh, also, I, you may have heard the, the song, hello, hello from the other side. So that's a song, uh, also a song. Um, um, so the importance of staying in touch. So let us have a reader for this one, Miss Claudia. Just so you can read from in paragraph 99, because we're this is all coming from paragraphs 95 to 99. So go ahead, Miss Claudia. All right. In paragraph 99, Shoki, Shoki Effendi acknowledges the difficulty of the task of establishing a residence and earning a livelihood for a considerable number of Baha'i pioneers. It would be of great importance if some pioneers can live on an income from their home country, even though sparse, and reside indefinitely in the pioneering countries. The beloved guardian cites an utterance in which His Holiness Baha'u'llah exhorts those who forsake their country to teach the faith. Here again, so here sorry. is the foremost. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Claudia, please. You're yeah, I was just reading the other part. The foremost quality of our pioneers was faith. With faith in God, they did what every pioneer does. They stepped forward into the unknown. And that's isn't, Alan H. Oaks. Isn't that cool? They stepped forth into the unknown. And that's what we should do in the sense of obedience, having faith. When the call goes, you go forth. And that, so here again, the beloved guardian calling upon the pioneers um, to go forth to these places, but also earn a livelihood, right? So that you're not being dependent on the resources of the treasury. So that, um, and in paragraph 99, In paragraph 99, this is an incredible uh, extract because the beloved guardian is now starting to, um, he cannot define the reward that will be coming to these pioneers. He cannot define it because it is limitless, limitless. There's no bottom of reward that these pioneers will, will have. So in paragraph 99, the beloved guardian states that the value of pioneering and travel teaching cannot be properly assessed. And the reward that the pioneers receive is limitless. And I also found it interesting in paragraph 99, the beloved guardian was very clear. He said, obviously that the reward is limitless, you know, in the sense of a spiritual reward through all the worlds of God. But it also the, the material benefit, and it's very clear in this paragraph that the material reward will also be in this world. So, in, uh, so the reward for a pioneer is more than just a blessing conferred on those souls in the future life and will include solid spiritual and administrative achievements. So that also there will be material reward for the pioneers and teachers. This is something that um, uh, the beloved guardian stresses. The victories won at the time in Bulgaria and Australasia by the North American believers were two good examples, the nature of these rewards. So we're going to talk about the, the victories. This is in paragraph 99 of the victories of Bulgaria and Australasia. And on the right, we have this extract from His Holiness Baha'u'llah. It says, teaching our cause is indeed the prince of all goodly deeds and the ornament of every goodly act. So the reward, as we all know, is immense. So this is our call. This is our greatest of greatest gifts is to teach the cause. Now we're going to get into paragraph 100. So now here, the beloved guardian is now going to talk about in this day and age, the courage of women. 
So these are two extracts that on the left is also from the Baha'i writings, as you see, and also on the right is also from the Baha'i writings. So it says, this is from, the, uh, um, I believe it's from Abdul Baha'i, it says, the woman has greater moral courage than the man. She has also special gifts, which enable her to govern in moments of danger and crisis. That's so cool. And so, and then on the on the right, um, it says you should not look at your limitations, but derive full confidence at the thought that, however limited your resources and capacities may be, your efforts will be reinforced by divine confirmations. You should not look at your limitations. That is probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks to anything i mean really before you even start something we often immediately look at our limitations i can't do it i don't i i don't know enough i'm whether it's uh, if someone asks you to give a talk for example someone asks you to give a talk oh i'm not good at speaking oh i don't know of enough you know uh i don't know enough about that subject or i'm a myriad excuses start coming up right and one after another. And here the beloved guardian says, do not look at your limitations. And the first thing we do is immediately look at our, look limitations, at our limitations. Right? It's the first thing we do. But here, but derive full confidence at the thought that however limited your resources and capacities may be, your efforts, whatever your effort is, getting up, arising, doing it, you will be reinforced by divine confirmations. That is, my dear friends, is so important. Getting up and doing it. Stop looking inward and look out. We uh, should be outward orientation, right? But we're constantly looking at our own limited self. <laughs> we're actually supposed to have an outward looking orientation in this day. And sending our focus should be on everyone else. Moving on. Now our first lady going to Bulgaria because in paragraph 99, the beloved guardian mentions Bulgaria. And who was this incredible person that put Bulgaria on the map in, in the sense of putting the name of Bulgaria in the advent of divine justice? So let us have our reader. And our reader is Miss Deborah. Miss Deborah, you're our reader. Go for Miss Deborah. Based on messages of the beloved guardian, it can be suggested that the reference to Bulgaria in paragraph 99 is to the sacrifices made and the victories achieved by Marion Jack, a Canadian Baha'i pioneer to Bulgaria. Marion Jack was born in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, on 1st December, 1866. She studied art in England and France and specialized in painting. She was introduced to the faith at a social gathering while she was studying in Paris. In 1908, she traveled to the Holy Land and spent time in Akka teaching English to Abdul Baha's grandchildren. During this period, she had the privilege of spending time with Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha admired her sense of humor, cheerfulness, and certitude, and gave her the nickname General Jack. Awesome. Very well read, Miss Deborah. General Jack, what a cool name Abdul Baha gave her. So here we have General Jack to hear she is age 18 years old. And there she is. Now this is, she's a little older in this photograph. Actions speak louder than words and through Marion Jack's deeds, we can glimpse the transformative effect the faith had on her life. In 1931, at the age of 65, 65 years old, that's not, you know, as they say, spring puppy anymore. She's 65 years old. Marion Jack, she moved to Bulgaria, following the guardian's request that she pioneer to that country. A few years later, 
when the imminence of war was clear, she pleaded with the guardian to let her stay at her pioneering post after he suggested that she move to a safer country. So the beloved guardian said, move out. But she pleaded with the guardian, I got to stay here. You asked me to be here, please, please. And in spite of poverty and poor health, first during the World Economic Depression, then during the war, and finally through the difficulties of living behind the Iron Curtain, she remained steadfast in her efforts to teach the faith in her adoptive country. She passed away on the 27th of March, 1954, at age 87 years old. So from 65 to 87, 22 years at her pioneering post. And even when the beloved guardian says, you know, the war is coming, she said, I'm staying. She begged the beloved guardian and still stayed strong there through war, through financial distress, everything. So here she is. Let me, this, she's right over here, right there. Baha'is of Sophia, 1932. Mary and Jack is seated four from the left. Four from the left. Let me make sure I'm, I'm, I'm po po pointing at the right lady. Yeah, I believe I am. Four from the left. Yeah, that was her, of course. I was, this is the left side, four from the left, right here. And in the second row, next to Lina Benki, with her husband, George Adam Benki, is holding a photograph of Abdul Baha, right here. These two, okay? And two Baha'is in the front row are displaying a representation in calligraphy of Baha'u'llah's name. This is Esmazan, Ya Baha'u'llah. And so here, this is a letter written on behalf of the beloved guardian, Shoghi Effendi, to the European Teaching Committee. May 24th, 1954. So let me have, let me have a reader on this. Okay, Miss Donna, Miss Donna, you have a beautiful voice. Go for Miss Donna. And a message written on his behalf to the European Teaching Committee dated 24th, May, 1954. The beloved guardian referred to Mary and Jack as an example for those who leave their homes to serve in foreign lands. For over 30 years with an enlarged heart and many other ailments, she remained at her post in, in Bulgaria. Pause right there, Miss Donna. Enlarged heart doesn't mean that she's got a big heart for love. That she actually had a physical infirmity of having an enlarged heart. So the beloved guardian saying she had an enlarged heart that actually is not a good thing to have an enlarged heart. So carry on. And many other ailments, please. Never well-to-do, she often suffered actual poverty and want, want of heat, want of clothing, want of food. When her money failed to reach her because Bulgaria had come under the Soviet zone of influence, she was bombed, lost her possessions. She was evacuated. She lived in drafty, cold dormitories for many, many months in, in the country. She returned valiant to the capital of Bulgaria after the war and continued on foot to carry out her teaching work. The beloved guardian himself urged her strongly when the war first began to, to threaten to cut her off in Bulgaria to go to Switzerland. She was a Canadian subject and ran great risk by remaining, not to mention the danger and the privations of war. However, she begged the beloved guardian not to, not to insist and assured him her one desire was to remain with her spiritual children. This she did up to the last breath of her, of her glorious life. Her tomb will become a national shrine immensely loved and revered as the faith rises in stature in that country. He thinks that every Baha'i, and most particularly those who have left their homes and gone to serve in foreign fields, should know of and turn their gaze to Mary and Jack. Awesome, awesomely read, Miss Donna. What a lady, what a lady, Mary and Jack, when he's the beloved guardian, writes so detailed of her suffering from being so cold. I mean, Bulgaria, so cold. 
and she suffered so much from war uh, to bombings to um, from one place to another. And here the beloved guardian pouring his heart out uh, at her sufferings. And, and then, and in the end here he says, he thinks that every Baha'i, and most particularly those who have left their homes and gone to serve in the foreign fields, should know of her and turn their gaze to Marion Jack. Now that, my dear friends, is our goal as be to become a teacher like her, like Marion Jack. May I, may I ask you a question, Sam? Please, please, dear <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you know any pioneer, pioneering this time in this COVID time that to do the pioneering? Yes, I do. Yes. There's, uh, I know of several pioneers actually that they're, they're at the pioneering post. There's, uh, I know, uh, of, uh, they're just um, teaching obviously during Corona and uh, going in to, to meet people. It's obviously difficult uh, and um, difficult task it's in the sense so you have to use restraints and protections and all of the things but yeah i know of several wonderful wonderful pioneers that in different countries yes dear testify oh, but okay. that's good. good to know for sure for sure okay so here again this is another cablegram from the beloved guardian this is another one you see how immensely uh powerful this lady is. So the beloved guardian sent out another cablegram. So this is on her passing. This was shared to all the national spiritual assemblies. So March 29th, 1954. Mourn loss of immortal heroine. So this is our title, immortal heroine, Marion Jack, greatly loved and deeply admired by Abdul Baha. Shining example to pioneers of present and future generations of East and West, surpassed in constancy, dedication, self-abnegation and fearlessness by none except the incomparable Martha Root. Her unremitting, highly meritorious activities in the course of almost half a century, both in North America and Southeast Europe, attaining their climax in the darkest, most dangerous phase of the Second World War shed imperishable luster on contemporary Baha'i history. This triumphant soul is now gathered to the distinguished band of her co-workers in the Abha Kingdom, Martha Root, Lua Getzinger, May Maxwell, Hyde Dunn, Susan Moody, Keith Ransom Keller, Ella Bailey, and Dorothy Baker whose remains lying in such widely scattered areas of the globe as Honolulu, Cairo, Buenos Aires, Sydney, Tehran, Isfahan, Tripoli, and the depths of the Mediterranean Sea attest the magnificence of the pioneer services rendered by the North American Baha'i community in the apostolic and formative ages of the Baha'i dispensation. Advise, arrange in association with the Canadian Nationalist Assembly and the European Teaching Committee, a befitting memorial gathering in the Mashalaskar, moved to share with the United States and Canadian National Assemblies the expenses of the erection, as soon as circumstances permit, of a worthy monument at her grave, destined to confer eternal benediction on a country already honored by its close proximity to the sacred city associated with the proclamation of the faith of Baha'u'llah. Share message all national assemblies, Shori. So the beloved guardian paid from his own pocket the monument to Marian Jack. What a lady, what a lady. And this dear friends is a is a station that we as Baha'is, as our goal to uh, try in every way to work to become a teacher of the cause of that caliber. So this is a lady of luster, a lady of magnificence is Marion Jack. And this is the monument, dear friends, that the contributions. So Marion Jack, immortal heroine, shining example to pioneers 
passed from this life, March 25th, 1954, Sofia, Bulgaria, where she had been living for 24 years as a pioneer of the Biafi. Her remains are buried in the British cemetery there. Okay, now in, in paragraph 99, another uh, mention is, so we mentioned uh, Bulgaria, but it was also mentioned of Australasia. So in paragraph 99, we're going to, uh, the aspects of Australasia is in regards to this couple, the Duns. So let us have a reader. Miss Valerie, are you available? I'm here. Excellent. The achievements in Australasia mentioned by Shoghi Effendi refer to the emergence and development of the faith there as a result of the work of Clara and Hyde Dunn, who left their home in the United States and took the message of Baha'u'llah to Australia. Hyde Dunn was born in London in 1855 and worked as a traveling salesman in Britain and continental Europe before migrating to the United States. At a tinsmith shop in Seattle in 1905, Dunn saw the shopkeeper in conversation with a man, Ward Fitzgerald, who had just returned from the prison of Akka, where he had met Abdul Baha. Hyde Dunn overheard Ward Fitzgerald quoting the, quoting the spoken by Baha'u'llah to E.G. Brown. This earth is one country and mankind its citizens. Regard ye not one another as strangers. Early translation. Hyde was attracted to these words and soon accepted the faith. So the picture there is of Ward Fitzgerald. He was the one that met Abdul Baha. Thank you very much. Great reading, Miss Valerie. So there, Ward Fitzgerald was in the presence of Abdul Baha. He heard um, the, the spoken words of Baha'u'llah to Edward Granville Brown. And the great uh, quote, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. And uh, that was shared with the uh, uh, Mr. Dunn, and in very shortly, he, he accepted because uh, that it immediately touched his heart. So in the picture, you see, this is a picture of Mr. Hyde Dunn and his beautiful wife, Clara Dunn. And Hyde Dunn met Clara Dunn in 1907 in Washington and taught her the faith, which she accepted after a while. And both Clara and Hyde met Abdul Baha in California in 1912. And being in the presence of Abdul Baha gave them both spiritual energy and strength that sustained them through the remainder of their lives. Dunn and Clara married in 1917 and they settled in Berkeley. This is so awesome. I, I love this section. In 1919, we all know of and heard of, we talked about these tablets of the divine plan. So in, in 1919, Hyde and Clara Dunn learned of the call of Abdul Baha in the tablets of the divine plan to the Baha'is of North America, to the message of Baha'u'llah, to distant lands to which he was not able to travel himself. They decided to, ri to rise the call and take the faith to Australia. And to reduce the cost, Clara suggested that Hyde, Hyde himself might go alone. And they sent a cable to Abdul Baha asking what course of action to take. He re Abdul Baha replied and said they should both go together. So Hyde Dunn was immediate. This is something also. Hyde Dunn immediately when he heard this call to go forth, he was one of those souls that was just immediate when he heard this call in the Tabra to Divine Plan. And uh, so it was uh, an incredible uh, spiritual energy that, um, that he jumped when he heard this call of the Tabra to Divine Plan. 
And this is a blessed tablet uh, revealed Saturday morning, April 1st, 1916 at Bahchi in honor of the friends of the 11 Western states. So this is the tablet revealed to the Western states. And it's, this is a- uh, What kind of tablet is this? <laughs> this is the tablets of the divine plan, uh, dear testifier. This is the one that was revealed by Abdul Baha um, in, uh, uh, during that period, um, 1915, 16, to um, calling the friends um, in North America to go forth and pioneer. So these were the tablets of the divine plan. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Excellent. So Hyde and Clara Dunn, they, they arrived in Sydney on the 3rd of February, 1920. They initially had some financial constraints until Clara found the job. So they didn't even plan, you know, what to do with money. They just went. And that's incredible for me. They just went. And so initially they had trouble finding a job, but they found a job. And Hyde started working as a traveling salesman within a year working in country towns during the week and returning home on the weekends. And Clara stayed in Sydney, inviting people to the meetings organized for the weekends in which Hyde spoke. So he was a traveling salesman. And so that's how he could go and meet everybody. He would go meet everybody, talk to them. And then on the weekends, um, Miss, uh, his wonderful wife, Clara, had organized uh, these wonderful gatherings, which were firesides. So all on the weekends, they would all these uh, people that he had met, they would come to the firesides and then Hyde would speak um, to uh, in these wonderful gatherings. So organized by them. So, so Hyde and Clara Dunn managed to foster the development of small, isolated Baha'i communities across Australia and New Zealand. And the first Australian local spiritual assembly was established in Melbourne in December of 1923, followed by others in Perth in July, 1924, Adelaide in December, 1924, and Sydney in April, 1925. And the local spiritual assembly was formed in Auckland in 1923. So through their activities, through their obedience, through their consecration and, and sacrifice and suffering, these communities emerged. And uh, really is how he had chosen his occupation of being a traveling salesman, of going out and meeting people. And then on the weekends, having firesides and everyone being invited to his home and that sense of openness and loving and welcoming and keeping his focus on the faith created and generated a fire within Australasia. So here's the Duns. So you can see them in the back. There they are. The first Baha'i feast in New Zealand, 1923. And hands of the cause of God. They were appointed hands of the cause of God. John Henry Hyde Dunn and Clara Dunn, both were appointed hands of the cause of God. And they're pictured in the back row, fourth and fifth from the left, respectively. So the beloved guardian, Shor Effendi, stressed the necessity of forming a national assembly in Australia and New Zealand when Clara met him during her pilgrimage in 1932. The National Spiritual Assembly of Australia and New Zealand was elected in 1934, and Hyde Dunn passed away in Sydney on the 7th of February, 1941. And a title that was given to him by the beloved guardian, Australia's Spiritual Conqueror. What a title, what a title. And here's the first national convention of the Baha'is of Australia and New Zealand, 1934. So they, they were here now called to elect their first national spiritual assembly. And all, every one of these wonderful souls was thanks be to the Duns, Clara and Hyde Dunn, the father and mother of Australasia. 
And here is the first National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Australia and New Zealand, 1934. So they elected their first National Spiritual Assembly. And at right, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Dunn, right here. And at left, Miss Amy Stevenson. This is a Baha'i of Auckland, New Zealand. So this is the uh, Baha'i from Auckland, New Zealand here. And after the passing of Hyde, Baha'is turned to Clara, the mother. She is the mother of Australia. And she, and they expected her to give talks to them because Hyde had been doing that the whole time. Imagine that. So now they're expecting her to give the talks to them. And in 1943, she settled in Brisbane for several months. She then resumed her travels, which had been interrupted by Hyde's illness. She started visiting Baha'is in the major cities and country towns. The beloved guardian appointed Clara and Hyde Dunn posthumously as hands of the cause on the 29th of February, 1952. And after a lifetime of tireless service, Clara passed away on 18th November, 1960. So here's Mother Dunn. She's called Mother Dunn. If you go um, anywhere in the, the Australasia, everyone knows her as Mother Dunn, the spiritual conqueror of that continent. In God Passes By, the beloved guardian, Shah Effendi, refers to the opening of Australia and New Zealand by the great-hearted, great-hearted and heroic Hyde Dunn. A new continent was opened to the cause. Imagine that, dear friends, someone opening a whole continent. This is what the Dunns did. A new continent was opened to the cause when, in response to the tablets of the divine plan, Unveiled at the first convention after the war, the great-hearted and heroic Hyde Dunn, at the advanced age of 62, promptly forsook his home in California and seconded and accompanied by his wife, settled as a pioneer in Australia, where he was able to carry the message to no less than 700 towns throughout that commonwealth. His name and her name are immortalized forever. The Duns, not only in one the right, but God passes by, Advent of Divine Justice, Hands of the Cause of God, their station and titles are immortalized for their sacrifice, obedience, and arising, arising. When the call went forth by Abdul Baha in Tablets of Divine Plan 1919, when they learned of it, they arose. And what an incredible um, sacrifice and um, history of bringing forth the communities of Australia and New Zealand. So, the new generations, we can't call ourselves a Baha'i because we are not doing nothing like them. We, this is our examples, dear Tesfaya. We cannot, we have to work on ourselves and arise. This is something that we, we have to work on, dear Tesfaya, for sure. You're absolutely right, dear Tesfaya. But there are many wonderful, wonderful souls too, uh, doing at uh, different capacities. Whatever we can, we need to do. So this is something that we have to work on. Um, and but do you think that the new generations is to be willing to sacrifice like the, our, our ancestors? We, they, they were, uh, we all have different calls, dear Tesfaya. You know, we all have different capacities. So, but may I, please, please, of course, please. May I say something? Um, uh, something happened last Sunday mm -hmm. after our Kitabi Gan class one of the uh, other attendees, whom I really don't know, but she's been there and I recognize her uh, on Zoom, uh, told us that she is in Australia at this time out in the outback. 
mm -hmm. and was giving firesides, you know, to Aboriginal uh, peoples out there. And uh, at the end of the class, she uh, had them come and, and in front of the camera and whatnot and say hello. And there were like five different Aboriginal uh, people from the out back there in her home. That's wonderful, wonderful, yes. Yeah, we have um, one of our regular friends that attend this class is from the Aboriginal areas, yeah. So yeah, you're absolutely right. There's wonderful souls that are um, all over the world. And it's thanks to their sacrifices and dedication. And as to dear Tess Fai's point, these heroes, these heroines are examples. And they, we have to look at our lives every day. And how can I become a better me? How can I be a better me? What can I do? How can I tomorrow strive to teach the cause? What can I do? How can I be of more service, not only to my family, but to my loved ones? What can I do? Because if you think and keep that foremost in your, in your head, it will eventually be translated into actions. If you're thinking about service, service will come forth from you. If you're thinking about teaching the cause, event, the words, the opportunities will present themselves. But if you're not thinking about it, it ain't, the opportunities will come, but you're, it's not here. You're not thinking about it. So you have to have that. That's why the beloved guardian says, teaching the cause of God should be your dominating passion. So if... That should be your first and most important thing that you want to, for it to come out, is to teach the cause of God. So that should be always there. So when that uh, moment arises, you're just ready to, to share the, the cause. So, but also, dear friends, uh, I remember um, I met this wonderful gentleman when I was at serving at Boshpa High School. And this uh, gentleman, it was a session and uh, God bless his soul, he passed away. It was a wonderful gentleman. What he said was, uh, we're sitting uh, in the Martha Root Hall, a uh, wonderful place. And we were sitting together and he said, Esan, um, I've always prayed to um, be a great teacher of the cause of God. I pray, I want to be a great teacher of the cause of God. And then I lovingly asked him, I was like, you know, I was like, so what are you doing to, per se, prepare the opportunities to go teach the cause of God? Because it's one thing to pray for it, right? But you have to make opportunities happen. You can't just sit in your house and close the door and pray that, you know, someone is going to go and come and knock on your door. And then that person will, you know, um, eventually become a, you know, hear about the faith. You have to make opportunities. Just like um, the Duns, they went forth. He actually changed his occupation in that sense. So he could have the maximum amount of opportunity to meet people. And then he dedicated every weekend to have firesides. This is what he did. I'm not saying every single one of us can do something of that level or caliber, but what are you doing in your life to make opportunities to proclaim his name? So this is about reordering, reorienting our lives so that we will make opportunities in our lives to proclaim his name. That's really what is, when it's called new race of men, we are re we're changing the focus of of how we were to how we should be and all of these great examples i'm presenting you are people that have shifted the focus and so uh, reorienting themselves that was a long answer to you dear testify but it's about um changing it's all right yeah but that's really what it's, it's about it's that they have really 
val have a, a higher sense of value of what's important, at least to my understanding. And so, and so they saw the value and they immediately jumped on it. And so that is the duns. And here you could see their resting place, the immortal resting place of both of them. And you can see on the left here, John Henry Hyde Dunn and Clara Mary Dunn. And these, they're both hands of the cause of God, first Baha'i pioneers of Australasia. So this is their immortal resting place. And it says, this is a quote from Abdul Baha. It says, whoso have attained their presence will glory in their meeting and all that dwell in every land. And, uh, they will be illumined by their memories from Baha'u'llah. And it says, make, make me to drink of the cup of sacrifice and set me free, Abdul Baha. So this is from two uh, extracts, one from Baha'u'llah, one from Abdul Baha on their resting place. So there you go. These are the two individuals that were in paragraph, highlighted in paragraph 99. So there was, um, General Jack, Marion Jack, uh, was from Bulgaria, and the Duns going to Australasia. So then we're coming to paragraph 100. So let me check my time. We're great. We're good, doing good on time. Okay. So then we come to paragraph 100. And in paragraph 100, the beloved guardian admires the work of the women in the West who have made that significant contribution to the progress of the faith and its establishment throughout the world since its inception of the cause in Western countries. The beloved guardian then cites a statement from Abdul Baha declaring that one of the miracles of this dispensation of Baha'u'llah, I love that quote. One of the miracles of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah is that women have shown greater boldness than men. And the beloved guardian then emphasizes the necessity for women to exercise this boldness more evidently throughout the virgin territories of Latin America to achieve great victories for the faith. And remember when this was written, the goals for the second part of the first seven year plan was to win the goals in Latin America. So in this day and age, the House of Justice is calling on, not, on men as well as the boldness of women to do what? Achieve the goals of the plans of the Universal House of Justice. This is what the women should be seeing, you know, achieving in this day and age. Though they should be exercising their boldness in winning the goals and achievements of, um, of the plans of the Universal House of Justice. So this is uh, an extract. This is a quote from Morgan Harper Nichols. She writes, bravery is the audacity to be unhindered by failures and to walk with freedom, strength, and hope in the face of things unknown. Oh, unknown. It always keeps us scared. We're always scared of the unknown, right? But it is the bravery, it's the audacity. And you're not thinking about failures. You're not unhindered. That doesn't bother you. But it's to walk with freedom, with your head raised, strength and hope and facing the unknown. This is how these great ladies walked and approached these um, incredible um, challenges. So we're going to go through some of these amazing handmaidens of Baha'u'llah in the West in this, in this uh, section, okay? So the early history of the faith in Europe and North America clearly shows that women played a critical role in establishing the faith in those regions, as well as taking the message of Baha'u'llah to virgin territories around the world. And here are my uh, extracts. Women are strong, absolutely. And here, this is from the great Malala. She writes, there are two powers in the world. One is the sword and the other is the pen. And there is a third power stronger than both and that of women. Isn't that a great quote? I love it. See, one is the sword and the other is the pen. And the third power is stronger than both 
is that of women. And this power, this third power, has been oppressed, being kept down, being subjugated. And this power has not had the full power to come out. And God knows when I cannot wait for the world to see that power come up. And that when that power emerges truly into the planes of the world, we will, that's when we will see peace coming into the world. Because women have not had their fair share on the on the on the on not only in education, not in rights. And that was a that's a beautiful quote from Malala. So okay. Our first great lady I'm going to share with you, Lady Blomfield. I, I don't know if how many of you know, have studied this incredible lady's life. So checking my time to keep us punctual. So our reader is, let me see. Let me see. Okay. I'm just double checking everyone. Dennis, are you with us? I am. <laughs> Excellent. Let's go. And uh, Mrs. McGregor is here too. So. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I love it. Okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, Headmaid's Mahala in the West, Lady Sarah Blomfield, an Irish star. Sarah Louisa Blomfield was born in Ireland in 1859, who lived primarily in London. She married Arthur Blomfield, 1829 to 1899 on the 21st April, 1887, became Lady Blomfield when he was knighted on 4th June, 1889. She accepted the faith in 1907, became an outstanding Baha'i. Lady Sarah Blomfield hosted Abdul Baha in London and accompanied him in Paris. She took detailed notes of Abdul Baha's talks in Paris and were later published in Paris Talks. Adwaha gave Lady Blomfield the Persian name Sitati Kanum, where Sitati means star, and Kanum means madam or lady. Mm, star lady. Beautifully, excellent, very well read. Yes, star lady. <laughs> Sitare Kanum. That is right. What an. She is a star. She is. Uh, um, she is a star in the concourse of Paola, in the heavens of Paola. Uh, and um, one of the things I did in 2020 was I read Baliuzi's immortal book, Abdul Baha, the Center of the Covenant of Paola. And it's uh, covering the, um, the entire life of Abdul Baha in, in Baliuzi's uh, book Ab on Abdul Baha. And this immortal heroine is mentioned, obviously, in Baliuzi's book. And one of the things that Miss Lady Blomfield did that I didn't put in this uh, little mini presentation on her life, she saved the life of Abdul Baha. And, um, and you can find out how she did that. I'm not giving it away. <laughs> But she, she saved the life of Abdul Baha himself um, during an incredible, incredible episode um, when uh, the, uh, there was an attack on the life of Abdul Baha and how she did it. And what she did is in Abdul Baha's book, Abdul Baha, the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. And she is the heroine that saved the life of Abdul Baha. And uh, so it's a very, I, I don't want to give it away, but because I want everyone, my students, everyone to read and go look for that. But it's right there in the book. The beloved guardian was in England when he heard the news of the passing of Abdul Baha in London in 1921. And Lady Sarah Blomfield accompanied him on his return to Haifa. She is was the shoulder that, uh, that the beloved guardian rested on in the sense of being comforted by this incredible tragedy of losing his grandfather, Abdu'l-Bah. 
the beloved guardian, his heart was ripped. He was completely grief stricken. And Lady Blomfield, this immense heroine, accompanied the beloved guardian to Haifa. In Haifa, Lady Sarah Blomfield recorded her experience of spending time with the Holy Family and her conversations with them. And she later published those notes together with her recollections of the days when hosted Abdul Baha in London. And it's in this uh, book called The Chosen Highway. I'm sure you've all seen it, The Chosen Highway. So here, this is the, the talks of her, uh, she recorded, Paris Talks. And this is um, the other one, The Chosen Highway. So these are from Lady Blomfield. What a lady, star lady, uh, her title. Another incredible thing, apart from those that we've already mentioned already, but another incredible thing about Lady Blomfield, Around 1920, Lady Blomfield decided to spend part of each year in Geneva. And it was there that she befriended Egalitine Jeb. Egalitine Jeb was the founder of the Save the Children Fund. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's an incredible organization, Save the Children Fund, and set up an assisting group, the Blomfield Fund, under the sponsorship of Lord Weardale in London. And during this time, she used her considerable influence to get the five point text drawn up by the Save the Children Fund International of the Geneva Declaration accepted by the League in 1924, which eventually was expanded into the Declaration of the Rights of the Child by the United Nations General Assembly in 1959. So, through her efforts of working with this children's fund, she managed to uh, establish rights for all children through the United Nations. Isn't that awesome? What a lady, what an incredible lady. And her also, the amount of uh, contributions to the Save the Children Fund International through all her works and everything, it massively increased during that period. And you could, uh, her name is lauded by the Save the Children International. And uh, she's considered one of the primary founders of Save the Children. So here we are, dear friends, this is the actual declaration of Geneva. And on 26 November 1924, the League of Nations adopted the Geneva Declaration on the Rights of the Child and this is it, this is the actual one. Um, the first international document promoting child rights. And it was a stepping stone towards the contemporary protection of children's rights. Because um, children were used in work. Uh, there, were, there was no rights to children. They were not only traded, they were also used in um, at a very young age as um, to uh, for working. So now the rights of children, in the sense of, uh, I read a few of these, it says the child must be given the means requisite for its normal development, both materially and spiritually. The child that is hungry must be fed. The child that is sick must be nursed. The child that is backward must be helped. The delinquent child must be reclaimed and the orphan and the waif must be sheltered. So now there, for the first time, the children are given rights. The child must be the first to receive relief in times of distress. The child must be put in a position to earn a livelihood and must be protected against every form of exploitation. The child must be brought up in the consciousness that its talents must be devoted to the service of its fellow men. So there you go. This is just an... Uh, the first one also is, is pretty cool, the both materially and spiritually protection, that the, the, the inner consciousness of the child should be protected, their minds. So this was drafted because of Lady Blomfield. Lady Blomfield also served for eight years as a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the British Isles. 
She gave many talks about the faith and supported artistic activities in the community, including those of a Baha'i theater group in London. She maintained correspondence with Baha'is all over the world. And her daughter, Mary Basil Hall, who had been given the name of Parvane, it is a Persian name of a star by Abdul Baha, served the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the British Isles for five years. And she described her mother as a wonderful personality and a deeply loved mother who faced difficulties with radiant acquiescence and invincible faith. So these are the qualities, dear friends, you, if you want to know what qualities we should be bringing in, radiant acquiescence and invisible, invincible faith. It was partly due to Mrs. Hall's generous bequest that the National Spiritual Assembly was able to buy what is now the National Baha'i Center at 27 Rutland Gate, London. So it's thanks to the daughter of Lady Blomfield. So hence is really thanks to Lady Blomfield having a daughter and thanks to the daughter's generosity that the, Nash, the current National Baha'i Center is at 27 Rutland Gate. And here you go, you can see Abul Ghassan Afnan and with Dorothy um, and Jared, John Farabi, and hand, that's a hand of cause of God. And there's Dorothy, this is, um, and there's Abul Ghassan Afnan. So you, there's uh, their uh, 27 Rutland Gate, 1954. So here we go. Lady Blomfield passed away on December 31st, 1939. And on learning of her passing, the beloved guardian sent this cable. Profoundly grieved passing dearly beloved outstanding co-worker, Sitare Khanu. Memory, her glorious services imperishable. Advise English community hold befitting memorial gatherings Assure relatives my heartfelt sympathy, loving, fervent prayers. This is her resting place, Sitare Khanu, Zara Louisa, Lady Blomfield, Abdul Baha's devoted maidservant, her glorious services imperishable. So there we are. Let me check my time. We have maybe have time for one more. We have so these wonderful ladies, so many wonderful ladies in our uh, cause. Uh, so we're going to go to Corinne True. Corinne True, another amazing lady. So let us have a reader. Miss Dini, Miss Dini, so wonderful to see you. Could you read this one for us? <clears throat> Corinne Knight True was born near Louisville, Kentucky on November 1st, 1861. After the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, the family moved to Chicago where her father had invested in Chicago real estate. In the late 1870s, she married Moses True despite her father's opposition. Corrine and Moses settled in Chicago and became active members of a Protestant church. They had eight children within 10 years. The family was very happy until their nine-year-old daughter, Harriet, fell down the basement steps and died. Following this incident, Corrine and Moses left the church and searched for an alternative Christian church. What a tragedy of losing a nine-year-old daughter. Yeah. So in 1899, thank you so much, Ms. Dini, for reading. Thank you. So in 1899, the loss of a son to diphtheria profoundly disturbed the family. And Corinne started to search more widely for answers to her deep questions. She learned about His Holiness Baha'u'llah in late 1899 and immediately accepted the faith. Soon afterwards, Corinne lost her seven-year-old son. Abdul Baha sent her a tablet counseling her on the death of her son. And in 1906, her 21 year old son died in a sailing accident. 
And this is a picture here of Corinne True and her youngest child, Nathaniel. This was, picture was taken a few days before Nathaniel was stricken by diphtheria in 1898. This is the child that died. He died in 1899, and this is one of the four children that she lost. I've always heard, you know, the hardest thing for a parent is to lose a child. This is, and she lost four of them. Incredible suffering um, that Corinne True went through. And on 25th, February, 1907, Corinne arrived in Palestine to see His Holiness Abdul Baha. And during her visit, Abdul Baha charged her with the responsibility of building the house of worship in Chicago and provided her with detailed instructions on how to achieve it. What a task, what a role, you know? <laughs> she just arrives in Palestine and Abdul Baha says, hey, now your new role is to go build this Mashallah scar. <laughs> what a role. And on her return, Corinne facilitated the creation of a national body consisting of both men and women to coordinate the work of establishing the temple. At the first convention held in Chicago in March 1909, delegates elected nine people to the executive board of the Baha'i Temple Unity, including Corinne True. So she returns to the United States and lets everyone know that she's been appointed by Abdul Baha to do um, this job of building the house of worship. And so they form this uh, committee, Baha'i Temple Unity. And this is the members of Baha'i Temple Unity here in front of the True Home on Kenmore Avenue, Chicago. And the room at the top of the house is where the first Baha'i Temple Unity Convention was held, March 21st through 23rd, 1909. So Corinne suffered more emotionally when her husband died from a heart attack and her last surviving son caught tuberculosis in 1910. Oh my God, what a tragedy. One thing after another, it's, it's like, so tragic. Um, uh, when I was when I was putting this presentation, I was crying. I was literally one tragedy after another in, in her life. It's what is truly heartbreaking. The son died three years later. Abdul Baha asked Corinne to join him at the Plaza Hotel after she had buried her son in the morning. Abdul Baha had lost all five of his sons. So you can see the time, how similarity of the suffering of his son is Abdul Baha losing all five of his sons and Corinne losing her sons and now recently her husband due to a massive heart attack. And I found this, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Yeah, and I found this quote to be very apt to this point. Sometimes in tragedy, we find our life's purpose. And that was when she lost her first son. If you remember, when she lost her first son, she, was, uh, she not left the Protestant church and she started seriously looking and searching. And, and so that's when she found her life's purpose. So this was, I found that quote to be apt. Abdul Baha called Corinne True, the mother of the temple. She was instrumental in initiating the construction of the temple by finding suitable land, organizing the meetings, and raising funds for it. She was a championess. She was a champion. A true force was Corinne True. And here is a picture, dear friends. Dr. Zia Baghdadi, this is him right here, Dr. Zia Baghdadi. He is turning the earth on September 24, 1920, prior to the beginning of the borings to locate the bedrock. And Corinne True is the first person on the right, right here, with the book at her feet. See, there's a little book at her feet right there. Okay, so there's Corinne True. Let's see Dr. Zia back that. 
Okay. And the first picture on the temple steps after the completion of the superstructure, May 1st, 1931. Here's Corinne True. She's circled on the left. How amazing, you know, coming from 19, you know, that 1911, 12, you know, periods, meeting Abdu'l-Bah and coming up. Now Abdu'l-Bah has told you, go forth, go build this temple. And now, 20 years later, you're on the steps of a superstructure and all these Baha'is are here. And you're just, a, you know, someone in the crowd. But that's thanks to you. What a lady. That's why she's the mother, you know, the mother of the temple. A group of Chicago women in front of the newly completed superstructure. These are some incredible heroines. Mary Lesh, Mrs. Robinson, Corinne True, Nettie Tobin. If you remember, if it did study the history of the temp Mashallah Scar, the temp she was the one that found the rock, the big boulder, Nettie Tobin. She was the one to put it in that wheelbarrow and brought it to the site. And that is the same stone that is in the uh, house of worship. You know, if you visited the house of worship, there's a, there's a rock there. And that was the rock that Nettie Tobin uh, put in her wheelbarrow. Mrs. Leading, Mrs. Lundberg, and Gertrude Bokima, Louisa Waite, Fanny Lesh. Fanny Lesh is an incredible lady too. There's not too much written about her, but on her passing of Fanny Lesh, the beloved guardian says, I am visiting you in spirit. I, am, he, he, uh, I have to share that. I'm going to uh, bring the exact extract of her past. Uh, it's in uh, Citadel of Faith. It's an incredible extract to memorialize Annie Lesh. And there's all, not too much written about her, but she must have been an incredible, incredible lady. Elizabeth Greenlees and Mrs. Ayas. This is the wife of Mrs., uh, Mr. Leroy Ayas, Mrs. Ayas. So, yes, Rios John, please don't hesitate. Go for it. Rios John, if I may. About the stone, the cornerstone. Yes. That's, that is there now mm -hmm. in the basement of the house of worship. I believe this stone was mentioned in the Old Testament or the New Testament uh, in regards to the construction workers re having rejected the stone. Mm. Uh, I don't, I can't, I don't, I cannot pinpoint the verse, the chapter and verse, uh, but um, I believe this, this stone is mentioned in, in the either Old Testament or New Testament. That's it's something for people to find out. That's an interesting uh, reference. I had not heard of that, but I'll, I'll definitely, uh, when I'm researching that, uh, keep an eye out for it. Thank you, Riyaz yeah, Yes, and, and we can see why it was rejected because mm. it's missing one of the corners, one of the 3D, three-dimensional. If the, if the, let's imagine the, the, the stone was a cube, Right. Or a tetrahed, no, not a tetrahed, but a cube-like yeah. cube, stone. Cube, cube, right, with, right. Uh, uh, with symmetrical sides and everything, and the corners as a cube. So this stone is missing one of those corners. We can see that uh, one of the corners of, of this cube is missing. Sure. And so the, the, constru the construction workers had rejected when Mrs. Um, Tobin went there uh, to this construction site, they said, yeah, take, take it. We, we, we reject, we have rejected the stone and she took it. Mm. And this is mentioned in, in the, either the Old Testament or, or New Testament. Thank you, Riyaz John. That was interesting. Uh, I have to keep an eye out for that. Thank you so yes, much. Yeah, and and in, in, the, in, in the scripture, it does mention that the uh, construction workers had rejected this mm -hmm. stone, the stone that was rejected by the, so this is something for research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're getting to 830. It's, uh, we're just, uh, let's finish up Miss Corinne True and then we'll close for tonight. So Corinne met the beloved guardian a number of times in her pilgrimage to the Holy Land. 
And the last time she met Shaul Effendi was in Haifa, 1952, when she was 91 years old. Shaul Effendi appointed her a hand of the cause of God on the 29th of February, 1952. She was one of several hands who attended the dedication of the house of worship in Wilmette on the 2nd of May, 1953. So she saw the completion of it. Isn't that awesome? So she was, her, uh, Abdul Baha called her to the task of building it. And on, in 1953, she was there at the dedication. And this is the actual cave, uh, announcement from the beloved guardian. The guardian announcing her elevation to a station of which she never would have considered herself worthy. Moved convey glad tidings, your elevation rank hand cause. Stop. Appointment officially announced, public message addressed all national assemblies. Stop. May, sec may sacred function enable you in rich record services already rendered faith Baha'u'llah. So this is where she was elevated to hand of the cause of God. And here she, and here she is, Corinne True, and these are her daughters. So these are her daughters right here, and this is her, Corinne True, and her daughters at the time of the dedication of the House of Worship, May first, nineteen fifty-three. And from the left, this is Dr. Catherine True, this is Arna True Perrin. And this is Mrs. True, and this is her other daughter, Edna True. And both Catherine and Edna, so this is Catherine over here, and Edna over here, they were both members of the National Spiritual Assembly at that time. And Edna was appointed a continental counselor by the University House of Justice in 1968. So this was Miss Corinne True. Let me see. And then she passed away in her home in Wilmette on the 3rd of April, 1961, when she was 99 years old. At the 53rd National Convention, a memorial service was held at the request of the Hands of the Cause at the World Center. And the foundation hall adorned with beautiful red roses and huge baskets of pink and white carnations was filled to capacity. The Hand of the Cause of God, Paul Haney, read messages from the two hands of the cause in the Western Hemisphere, Mr. Khadem and Mr. Sears from the Asian hands of the cause gathered in Tehran from the National Spiritual Assemblies of Persia, of the Arabian Peninsula and of Scandinavia and Finland. And these are the uh, extracts. I just wanted to, you to see the loss that, uh, and what an incredible lady. The most beautiful of these messages eulogizing this great heroine of Baha'u'llah came from the hands of the cause at the World Center. Grieved loss, distinguished disciple, Abdul Baha, hand cause, Corinne True. Her long association, early history faith in America, raising Mother Temple West, staunch, unfailing championship covenant, steadfast support, Beloved guardian, every stage unfoldment, world order, unforgettable, enrich Anal's faith, Western world. And this is her immortal resting place. The most venerable figure among the veteran pioneers of the faith in the West had passed away quietly April 3rd, 1961. It's really a beautiful story. Even her seeds are blessed. So my dear friends, there we go. So we have several other amazing immortal heroines that we'll be covering up in next week's class, but I hope you enjoyed uh, taking you through some of those um, heroines in this uh, section. And any thoughts, any uh, insights or learnings or questions at this point before we have our closing prayer? Really beautiful. It motivates us now. Now it's really good, especially for Lady Sue. Yes, it is. It's inspiring, man, woman, whatever. I mean, what, yeah. uh, what, what a champions these uh, ladies were from the duns to just 
and and go read uh, and their stories. I hope this also inspires you to go look at uh, and find out who who were the Dons, who who was Mary and Jack, who was um, this incredible incredible lady, um, you know. And we're going to get to so many more uh, that I'm going. You'll find out next week. Um, so a good uh, example of the two wings of the birds. And as we the quote we found out truly. One wing is actually stronger than the other. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm too humble and I don't want to mention which wing it is, but we're covering it right now. <laughs> Namely women. Women are a much stronger wing, and, but man has to keep up. <laughs> so that's the reality. And um, I honestly believe that um, it is the love of women for men that they are helping man. You know, it's and because their wing is stronger, so they're pulling more weight. But because man is actually subjugating women in, in many and uh, countries and uh, domineering over women, uh, women in many countries, it, it makes it look that the male wing is stronger, but it's actually not. And we find that in all the writings. Let me tell you, in one of the uh, great ancestors in cultural way of expressing in back home is to be, man is always, you know, the head of the house, but the lady is the neck. The head is not moved without the neck. So <laughs> that's the most important thing. If your neck is turned around, you can't move your head. That's so true. You know, and... Um... Uh, another wonderful example, thank you, dear Tespai. Another wonderful example before we close off is the game of chess. The, the, the king is very limited in its movement. They think the king is the most important, but the, who is truly the, the most important piece in the board? It is the queen. So that is a, you know, a great example of who truly is, has the power. And it's the ladies, the women. So exactly. yeah. So, dear friends, without any further ado, it's been a pleasure. And as always, thank you so much. And let us have a closing prayer and we'll close off uh, this evening. Thank you so much. Any one of you, dear friends, uh, feel free to share a prayer. Thank you. Ms. Miller, you're mute. I know you're saying a prayer, but we can't hear you. Oh my God, oh my God, this is a lamp lighted by the fire of thy love and a blaze with the flame which is ignited in the tree of thy mercy. Oh my Lord, increase his enkindlement, heat and flame with the fire which is kindled in the Sinai of thy manifestation. Verily, thou art the confirmer, the assister, the powerful, the generous, the loving, Abdul Baha. Thank you, you the beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much to all my dear friends. Thank you Hello, so much. Alawapa, wishing you a wonderful Alawapa. night. Lovely to see my dear friends, Dennis and Mary, wishing you a wonderful night to all of you, Miss Donna, to Deborah, to Be my dear to Darla and Claudia. Alawapa. 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 Have Thank a great you. night. Thank you so much, everyone. Alawapa. Thank you all. Alawapa.